Good morning. Happy Sunday. We're so glad you're here. Let's go ahead and stand up and join in on some worship. our Lord and friend together this morning. If you are a first time guest, welcome. We are glad that you're joining us. If you wanna grab the connect card that's in the seat back pocket in front of you, fill that out, say hi. We would love to follow up with you later this week and share a little bit more about our church family and what it looks like to plug in here. On the back of that is also our prayer request card. You can check that out, fill it out, drop it in the black box. We've got a team um, that prays over those each and every week. And so if there is something you wanna lift up for our church family to be in prayer about with you, we would love to do that. 
Today we are continuing the Good and the Beautiful series about God's good design for this world and his people. Today's topic is a bit sensitive. It is specifically on sex. And so if you've got kids with you, there's still plenty of time to check them into Kids You Upstairs, where we will welcome them excitedly and ready to celebrate Jesus and do activities, um, age-appropriate content for them. And so that's right up the stairs outside of the door. So there's still plenty of time to do that. And obviously parents use discretion with your middle schooler and high schoolers. We know that these topics are important and they matter. And that's why we dive into them together as a church family. But right now we are going to continue in song.
you're here with us in person, please grab it from the right side of the row and pass it down, grabbing a cup if you wish to partake. And if you're at home, you can grab coffee, crackers, juice, whatever you have available to represent the elements. Communion as a practice was given to us the night before Jesus went to the cross as he was gathering with his closest disciples and sharing a meal. In Matthew 26, verse 26, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. And then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it. This is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And so we take time each week to remember that Jesus's body was broken for you and for me. And his blood was poured out to forgive the sins of many for all of God's people to make a way home for us, to have our sins cast off of us and put on Jesus, who was then hung on the cross. And Jesus' blood covered all sins, the sins we readily admit to, the sins we hope that no one ever finds out about, the sins that maybe have just hung over our heads for a number of years, but Jesus' blood is for each and every one of them and it's forgiveness for all of them. And there is now freedom in the new life that he has given to us who call him Lord and Savior. So we take the bread, if you would take it with me. Representing Jesus' body, take it and eat. And we take the cup, representing his blood, which was a sign of the new covenant between God and his people. Take it and drink. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your son. God, thank you for the way that he brought your kingdom to us. Thank you for the sacrifice that he was, God, to cover all of our sins. God, and thank you for his resurrection that brings us into new life. God, thank you for both the freedom and hope we have in him. We love you, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is Amaya, and I am the senior year here at Cookson, and I've been here since September of 2020. My name is Lexis. I'm in eighth grade, and I've been at Cookson for about a year and a half. Hello, my name is Michael. Uh, I'm a senior here at Cookson Hills, and I've been here for almost a year and a half. Hi, my name is Renee. I'm a junior here at Cookson. I've been here for about a year and a half. One of my favorite things about Cookson is the variety of literature to choose from. Um, much, we have a wide variety, and I, I'm a reader, and I love it. I like a lot of things about Cookson, but I especially like um, going on trips like the getaway, summer camp, and ICOM last year was a lot of fun. And then I also really like the staff, they're super sweet. Something I love about Cookson is the relationships I've built uh, with my house parents, house siblings, friends, um, and teachers, and just all the staff here at Cookson. I play volleyball and I'm on the percussion team, and I'm a student ambassador here at Cookson. And I just really enjoy the experiences we get to have. Um, and that wouldn't be possible without you, so thank you. And thanks so much for supporting Cookson, it really means a lot to me. Thank you so much for your support here at Cookson. I just want to say thank you so much to all your support to Cookson Hills. It's given me a second chance at life and that's been monumental for me. Um, and it's going to have a positive impact on future generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you! It is
it is so cool to partner with Cooks and Hills and see the way that they are taking students who, who do need a fresh start, who maybe have gotten into some kind of trouble or who are struggling with a variety of life circumstances and give them support, give them community, um, education, but ultimately hope in who Jesus is for each and every one of them and the ability to start a brand new life with him. Um, and we only get to partner with Cooks and Hills in doing that um, because of our church's faithful giving. Thank you. Thank you, church, for um, being a part of those kids' lives. Um, we get to do that together. And we get to support 30 other organizations locally and globally as a church um, who are spreading the hope of Jesus locally and worldwide. So thank you. If you came prepared to give today, you can find information at university.church slash give in the UCC Hub app, where there are black boxes as you exit the auditorium or balcony. As you do that, let's check out church news. If you've been wondering what it would look like to become a member of University Christian Church, attend Belong today at 12.15 p.m. At Belong, you'll hear from our team about what it looks like to be involved in and committed to our church family. If you didn't RSVP, we can't guarantee childcare, but we would still love to have you join us today, right after the 11 a.m. service for Belong. You may be wondering about Grounded, our women's event happening November 8th and 9th. And today we wanted to rapid fire a few questions and answers. What do we do at Grounded? We worship God through music together. We have time to share stories with other women. We hear testimonies and speakers. We may laugh, may cry. You can find the full schedule on the registration page. Changes based on your feedback from last Grounded have been made. What's included in my registration? Friday night snacks, your event booklet and supplies, a t-shirt, and Saturday breakfast with a few surprises sprinkled in. Why grounded? Every woman carries so much, maybe work, family, home life, not to mention our own hearts and minds. No matter what season of life you find yourself in, it can be hard to carve out time to slow down, to put down the things that we carry, and to focus on God. And we do that at Grounded by unpacking His Word in a community of women who can share their walks with God in ways that may help or encourage us to keep Him grounded in Him and to keep going. How do I sign up? Visit the Events tab of the Hub app or check out university.church slash calendar. To check out other events happening this fall like Child Dedication or Operation Christmas Child, visit university.church slash calendar or visit the Events tab of the Hub app. You can also follow along with us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. Well, I hope you're all ready to be uncomfortable because we get to talk about sex. Uh, if you didn't catch the PG-13 warning earlier, this is a great time to take your kids to our Kids U uh, Children's Ministry upstairs. Uh, and I know how well I will have done my job today based on how much you squirm. <laughs> that is my hope. So I also want to recognize there are all kinds of emotional responses when it comes to sex. For some, it's exciting and fun. For others, uh, there's shame attached because of past mistakes, uh, sin, even misunderstanding. Uh, and for others, there's trauma. There is uh, all kinds of pain due to mistreatment, abuse, or even assault. I also want to acknowledge that Christianity has done damage in this area. The purity culture of the 80s and 90s did a number on the psyches of many people, uh, specifically many women. And uh, we want to not do that. And, and some of that still affects us today. We're still dealing with some of the fallout of that. But as we dig in and talk about God's design for sex, I want to repeat Michael's words from last week. We must balance truth with grace. There will be some uncomfortable truths that I share this morning, uh, maybe some conviction from the Holy Spirit that comes through, 
But God's grace is enough to cover anything that you've done in your past or anything that's been done to you. Second is the grace we need to show one another. I'm wearing this shirt on purpose today to remind you that nobody is perfect here. The people who stand on stage, the people sitting around you in the audience, we love you. We want to walk with you. None of us has been perfect when it comes to God's design for sexuality. We're not here to judge you. This place is the people of God is where you belong. You're not going to be kicked out or thrown aside because we know that through Jesus, restoration happens. And we can all receive grace when we come to him. So keep those things in mind as we dig in together today. Also, please know that we can't cover everything. I've just got a chunk of the, the, the sermon today. We'll have a video testimony, and then Barry's going to come out and close us out. So there's no way we can cover everything. But right off the bat, I want to give you the basics for God's design for sexuality. And here it is. Sex is good within God's ordained context of one man and one woman in marriage. Sex is good within God's divinely ordained context of one man and one woman in marriage. Let's break that down. What do I mean by sex is good? Well, God created sex. We didn't just come up with it on our own. Uh, there are body parts that you have that only exist for the pleasure and intimacy of sex. God created those parts on purpose, for that purpose. God also created chemicals in your brain that are released when you experience sex with someone else. These chemicals not only make you feel good, but they build a connection. They create connection between you and that other person. Sex also existed before sin entered the world. God's first command to Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply. And after much Hebrew study, I have found that what he means is go do the hippity-dippity. <laughs> go practice marital intimacy exercises. That's what he told them. And this was before sin. This tells us that sex in and of itself is not a sin. It was created by God as a good gift. However, that's only when it's used in the context of God's defined marriage. Jesus himself gives us what that definition is, which is based in the Genesis creation account. A Pharisee tried to trap Jesus with a question, and he asked him uh, about divorce. And Jesus responded with this from Matthew 19. He said, haven't you read the scriptures? They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. From Jesus' own lips, we hear God's design for marriage. One man, one woman being united as one. And marriage is a covenant relationship meant to mirror God's covenant relationship with his people. A theological dictionary says that a covenant is a sacred agreement. It's a relational bond established by God, characterized by mutual obligations and divine promises. In the covenant relationship between God and his people, God never failed. He always pulled his weight. He always did his part of the covenant. The people of Israel, they failed over and over again. Sometimes monumentally. But despite their failures, God remained faithful to them. And when it comes to marriage, both parties fail. We both mess up. But it's a covenant because you agree to stay together through that hurt and through those difficulties. And while divorce can use its own Sunday, maybe even its own series... We recognize that it's a reality, and the same message of grace and truth applies to any of you who have experienced the heart-wrenching reality of divorce, that you are still welcome here, you are not judged based upon your past, there is no shame, we invite you and want you to be part of us, you belong with us. Circling back, because marriage is a covenant relationship, sex is intended to be reserved as a covenant action. It's intended to be sacred and beautiful, even considered 
worship because you're fulfilling a piece, just a piece, not all of it, a piece of the, of the purpose that God has for the intimacy of your relationship. Sex is a powerful form of intimacy and is meant, therefore, to be in a relationship that has the highest form of commitment. All relationships stand on those two legs, intimacy and commitment. The covenant relationship of marriage is where those two things are at their highest level and they have the best opportunity to remain balanced, which means that that leads to a functional and healthy relationship. Anything outside of marriage then creates imbalance. Pursuing high intimacy and low commitment sounds like fun and, you know, freedom, but... Studies have shown that in the long run, that pursuit is very unfulfilling. Now, maybe you've noticed and maybe you haven't, but I haven't shared any Bible verses that say we should not have sex outside of marriage. And if you look through your Bible and you look for the command, thou shalt not have premarital sex, you'll never find it because it's not there. But what the word in the New Testament, the Greek, uses the word porneia. And this word, the definition is a surrendering or a selling off of sexual purity. It involves any type of sexual expression outside the boundaries of a biblically defined marriage relationship. The most common English translation we have for the Greek word porneia is sexual immorality. And that happens again and again and again in, in throughout the New Testament. Uh, it's also de- uh, translated as whoredom, which is a pleasant thought, of course. Uh, and also fornication, which is not a word that we use in regular everyday life, uh, but also idolatry, which is interesting in that we turn sex into an idol, something that we worship. But anytime you come across that phrase, sexual immorality, this is what the porneia is what we're talking about. And did you catch the idea of it being a selling off? It's referring to something of great value that is sold for a pittance of what it's worth. And those of you who are younger in the audience, engaging in sexual immorality is being a sellout to your purity. Any engagement with sexuality outside of marriage is porneia. This includes, but is not limited to, pornography, masturbation, sexual fantasies, oral sex, anal sex, and anything and everything in between. Now, there's a, some uncomfortable things in that list. Uh, pornography is an easy one to match to porneia uh, because of the words. Uh, the Greek word porneia is the, uh, the origin for the English word pornography. And it's such a trap for so many people. Uh, and not just guys, it's not just a guy issue anymore. Many, uh, much more women and, and girls are getting trapped into this, this cycle. And one of the dangers of porn is that the more you engage with it, the more it rewires your brain. It actually changes the way you think. It changes the way you think about sex, the way you view others, the way you view yourself, uh, it makes your wants feel like needs, and it can become an, a legitimate addiction. Along with that, and, and this is true for other sexual sin as well, the, the secrecy, the shame, the self-loathing, the fear of getting caught, and what pleases you at first no longer does it for you. You have to go deeper the more hardcore to get the same level of arousal as you did with much more tame content. It's all a slippery slope down the rabbit hole. Uh, The further you spiral, the more trapped you feel. Uh, In my long years of youth ministry, uh, the most common question students would ask me when it came to sex and purity was, how far is too far? How much can I do with my significant other and it not be considered sin? Or, if we're going to be honest, 
how, how much without it being bad sin. Because most of us are okay with a little bit of sin, right? But I, I, I think this is the wrong question to ask, the wrong mindset to have. Because if porneia is a selling off of our purity, then asking that question, how far is too far, is asking, how much of my purity can I sell off and still remain pure? And the logical answer is none. What we're asking is how close can I get to the edge of the cliff and walk without falling off? I think the correct mindset here, the right question to ask is how close can I walk to Jesus? How far away from the edge can I walk so I have no chance of falling off? How sacred can I hold my purity? You ready to dig into some verses? Because we're going to fly through a bunch. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. Verse 18, same chapter. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Galatians 5.19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. He goes on and on with that list. Colossians 3.5, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, we all want to know what's God's will for my life. Here's a specific example where it says... God's will is for you to be holy, to stay away from all sexual sin. Ephesians 5, 3, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. The New Testament is clear. Any engagement in sexuality outside of marriage is sin and is not God's will for our lives. Now, remember, grace and truth. We've got to put those together. There's no shame, no judgment. I am just as guilty in all of this as you are. I've had my own journey with porneia and the brokenness that goes along with it. And this can feel helpless and hopeless, because I mean, is it even possible to follow God's design for sexuality? Alone? No. I don't think you could do it by yourself. With the help of the Holy Spirit and surrounded by trusted relationships who are going to help you to not fall and to walk with you through the dark times? Yeah. I think there's hope there. And if you're feeling anything right now, anything stirring inside of you, it may be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And remember that God doesn't work in shame. He doesn't say, look at this, look how bad you are. God never does that. That's the enemy. God says, yes, this was bad, but let's go forward together. That's conviction. That's healthy. It's good. It hurts. It's no fun when God gets all up in your business. But I promise you that on the other side of conviction and repentance is freedom. But I want to ask the question, why? Why is God's design for sex to be solely within a loving covenant marriage relationship. It can't just be about following rules, and surely God's just not trying to be a killjoy, ruining all of our fun. Why? Well, there are practical reasons. If the Bible's message on sex was obeyed, there would be far fewer sexually transmitted diseases, far fewer abortions, far fewer unwed mothers and unwanted pregnancies, far fewer children growing up without both parents in their lives. God's design actually saves lives, protects babies, gives sexual relations their proper value, bolsters families, protects the hearts and emotions of parties involved, and most importantly, it honors God. 
There are practical reasons why. But I don't think those are the most important. I think they matter. But I think the most important reason is encapsulated in 1 Corinthians 6. We explored a couple of those verses earlier real quickly, including the idea to flee, to run from sexual sin. Here's what it says, starting in verse 18. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. Your body is the temple of God. Now, you may have wondered why this trash can has been up here this whole time. Uh, and the reason is simple. I brought my trash to church today. I think we should all start bringing our trash to church and just dumping it here every week, right? And some of you are out there going, what in the heck is he talking about? Because this is absurd. No one thinks it's appropriate to bring their trash and dump it at church because there's a sacredness to this place in some ways. Even though it's just sheetrock and studs and it, it concrete, it's a ministry tool, but we still wouldn't bring our trash here. And yet we all have zero problem dumping garbage into the temple of God, do we? Myself included. We have no problem filling God's temple with trash through our actions, through the things that we listen to and watch. And that's what Satan, our enemy, wants to do. He wants to dump trash in God's temple, in you. And being the temple is relational. That's why it matters how you use your body when it comes to sexuality. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you have invited God to come and dwell inside of you, to be the temple where he dwells. It's a covenant relationship. And you're not just your own. You have been bought at a very high price, the life and death of our Savior, Jesus. So because this is a relationship that is sacred and precious, honor God with your temple, with your body. Barry sat down and interviewed a couple from our church who had both been married before, were starting a new relationship. They'd made some mistakes in the past and wanted to do things God's way with their new relationship with each other. They chose not to make sex the cornerstone of their relationship, but their love, their friendship. And then life decided to throw them some pretty nasty curveballs. Let's check out David and Lisa's story. Well, Dave and Lisa, I, I am looking forward to just having this discussion with you. And I want to just start kind of back at the beginning. I've got to see your love story. So what first, when did you just go, oh, and you noticed the other? For me, it was right here at UCC. She uh, sat in the middle section towards the back, and she always came in by herself. And uh, for three years, I noticed her. <laughs> I'm a little slow, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, I didn't have the same uh, experience she as you did. did. <laughs> she did not. I just came to church and came and went, talked to Mick, talked to whoever's standing there, and walked right by him every Sunday morning. And uh, I'm uh, easy to miss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the only one day I walked into a grocery store and he could he was in there and he could tell that something was wrong with me. And he came up to me and he goes, you look like you need a hug. And picked me up, I did not know him, and picked me up and gave me the big hug. And I'm like, whoa. And his daughter was there, he goes, you know her? He goes, nope, but I do now. And he came up to me the following Sunday at church. So that's how we started talking. I said, if we're gonna do this, we need to do one thing. And I said, we need to take the intimacy yeah. factor out of this. I want to get to know you for who you are. I know for Dave that was something that we talked about as well and, and how did you respond when I first challenged you to say hey you know God's plan you're a follower of Christ and I told I shared with you a lot of times uh, couples who have been down the road they've already had a marriage in their past 
it's almost harder for them to say no because it's already become such a normal. What did you first think of this? We all knew that it was God's will. That's what he he asked for us to do anyway. Uh, We tried everything else. I had tried whatever, and it didn't work. So I was surprisingly open to it. Uh, When you asked me, I, I was surprised that I wasn't surprised, actually. And then you were really surprised when I said, yep. I was kind of hoping you'd hold out on that. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> oh. yeah. Well, I know that uh, you guys had a, a rough start to marriage because it wasn't very far in, and you got some really serious news. And I, I know it was a long journey, and there's a lot of stuff I don't even understand, but can you give kind of just in a nutshell, what were you told, and kind of what happened then? Well, Lisa uh, had been an oncology nurse for 23 years when I met her, and she discovered some symptoms that I had, and I went in for my annual blood work, and I discovered that I had a blood cancer, and it was everywhere. Uh, So I, um, up to the age of 59, was pretty much bulletproof, or so I thought. And so that was right out of the gate. We hadn't even been married a year when when we discovered that. I think, though, that before we got that diagnosis we were in life group with Greg and Janae and we we were going to church and we were doing everything we could do to yeah. grow spiritually so then when that got hit it was I was like okay is this God's will or what's going on here but I think we were strong enough at that point mm-hmm. that we were going to be by each other's side no matter what Amen. so and I did discover trust through that yeah not only in god but in my wife uh we were new we had only hadn't even been married a year i love from the outside seeing your guys's relationship because that relationship was built on something that was solid it was a commitment together we are going to do this we're going to fight for not fight against and then i saw your love for god and the that man so the bible says a, a quarter of three strands is not easily broken and it had you and the, and god together that that is what i saw pull you through over and over and over again well, i'm proud of you guys i want to ask if if you were to give some advice to whether it be a young couple or a couple your age just to say, hey, here's what I want to leave you with. Here's something I would challenge you to, especially when it comes to putting God first. What would that be? If it was the younger generation, I would definitely make sure that they were equally yoked. Yeah. Um, Because when you're not, it just throws the whole relationship. There's just... Yeah. not working. I always found it interesting at the end of life, some people are at such peace because they know what's next. They know it's they're going to be in the kingdom with the Lord. Yeah. And when I found out that my future was very uncertain, I felt that peace. I was uh, That was an amazing blessing in the darkest time of my life. And some days I feel like I don't have enough faith. Thank like, gosh, am I not living the way I should be living? Am I not trusting in him enough? It was tough. Yeah. Even when you're evenly yoked, it's hard. Yeah. But to know that God is, and I think both Lisa and I know that even on our worst days, we have him to count on and lean on. And that, that made all the difference for me. He really did. You know, I'm so proud of Dave and Lisa. Um, just the fact that they decided to choose God's way over the way of the world. You know, that's uh, becoming extremely uncommon in and out of church. And, you know, as a result, the relationship was just deeper. Because when you do it God's way, it just works out better. And that's the thing that so many miss is they they feel like God's holding out on them or or maybe they're not going to... Oh, God's not holding out on you. He wants the best for you. See, what happens is that everybody hits bad times. 
Nobody goes into marriage thinking they're going to, but we all do. Hey, you're going to have health problems at some point. You're going to have financial issues. You're going to have arguments. You're going to have tensions. You're going to have struggles. Uh, That's part of this life. And the Bible says that in this world, you will have trouble. Just period. So here's the thing. When you get things out of order and you base it all on the physical, then when the bad times come, Instead of the physical just being a blessing to the foundation of a marriage, which is emotional and spiritual and mental oneness, it collapses. See, God wants you to have each of those, and the physical is an incredible blessing that comes alongside once you've built the others, but it trumps very quickly otherwise. So... In 30 years of ministry, this wonderful gift of God has been one of the most abused, confused, and misunderstood subjects that's brought to me, both by those single and those married, over and over. See, for those outside of marriage, they come in with every excuse as to why their situation is different, and it's okay to ignore what God has said. And those within marriage, I, gotta, I just got to say, I'm so sorry because the church historically has done a terrible job setting you up for success. We've told you, hey, don't go into the ditch. But few churches ever actually step in and say, hey, here's how you make it beautiful. Here's how you just keep the weeds out. Don't. Now what? Well, just don't before. And that's as far as the church has gone. And and so I want to say I'm sorry. And now let's just talk real short about what's next. Because I know some of you have made bad decisions. That's those before in marriage and some that are in marriage. And you're dealing with scars or you're dealing with addictions even. And I just want you to know, as Josh shared earlier, there is grace and truth here. And first of all, I want you to know there's hope for you. You are loved. God is not done with you. He has a future and a plan that is good for you. No matter your past, your past does not define your future. Let God do that. And so if there is a lot of hurt or struggles or confusion or you need help, don't be afraid to ask for help. We have a resource in your outline just to help you find a good counselor who can help walk through some of that pain and talk that out. We have another link in there for Celebrate Recovery, a wonderful ministry that meets on Tuesday nights that deals with hurts, habits, and hangups, no matter what they are, and they would welcome you with arms open wide to talk about whatever you've been through. Now, for those who are about to be married or are married, I want to equip you and help you. I have a resource that I've put in there that is something that I've worked on for years. And uh, that resource is just a, an intimacy guide, a video talk that I want you to watch first. And then you have a discussion guide that you're to talk through. Now, I want to make clear that this is for those who are about to be married or those married. That's the purpose of this. And so in that, while the church has done a lot of don't, this is really about how to set it up for success. These are many lessons that I've learned in our own marriage, stuff that we've worked through and stuff that has been given to me and advice from others. And I just want to challenge you to take some time this week. Go through that together. And it's just something that you and the, as a couple and the Lord would process through. Now, I want to also make very clear, it's very blunt. I, I'm just very honest and straightforward. And so that's another resource for you. Here's the thing. As we close, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for our church. I want to pray for the next generation. I want to pray for the marriages that are struggling. And possibly you're like, I I need, yeah, I got resources for later, but I need to respond. 
You know, we have the prayer benches. We call them right up front. And you're welcome during the invitation or during worship at any point to just come and kneel and pray. And it's just between you and God. You might want to pray for your marriage or your kids or for your friends or for society or for your own self. But we also have a prayer corner in the back on the main level. And uh, if you'd like someone to pray for you, we're going to have a few uh, just leaders in the church back there ready and just to receive you and talk with you and pray for you. So let me pray. And at the end of this, we're going to go into another time of worship and it's your chance to respond. God, our society is, is, is so confused right now. You've given this beautiful gift to enjoy and And it's abused beforehand and then so many couples are totally confused and rather than coming together and celebrating and this gift in the context of marriage, even there, they don't know how to make it beautiful. And so Father, I ask that you would reclaim the the bedroom as you intended for it to be, that you would build marriages that are healthy and at the center, you would be right there. Father, I know there's an evil one that has tried to distract and destroy and confuse. And Father, I ask for protection against his lies in each one who's listening right now. God, I ask in Jesus' name that your light would be brighter than the darkness, that his lies, that he comes out as a a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing would be exposed in their hearts. And oh God, I thank you I just thank you for the redeeming factor because I know some are feeling broken. They're feeling shame. And Lord, I'm so thankful you give grace and you give love and you give hope that we can do this together with you and others. So Lord, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand?
prayer as we go out into our weeks that God will continue to work in us and work through us. We love you guys. Our prayer corner is available. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.